OK, so that's where we are. Uh, as a brief review, when we started uh, talking about generally testing any kind of application, but you know, certainly software as a service, we have spent the last week or so talking about uh, integration tests, also called full stack tests, uh, also potentially called acceptance tests, if the test is based on a user story that came out of a customer meeting. And basically, those, as you've seen, are a description of a complete workflow to accomplish some task or some subset of a task. That means that typically, in terms of your app, a single integration or full stack test is going to uh, include some, a number of HTTP requests back and forth or a number of interactions between the user and the app. We have not yet talked very much about module or functional tests, which is behavior that doesn't necessarily take a lot of different steps from the user's point of view, but it does touch a lot of different parts of the code. So for example, uh, thinking about what happens when a route hits your controller, right, get or post with some URI, uh, your controller has some code that will run. Maybe that code does something with the model and with the database, maybe not. And then at the end, it probably will either redirect or render some kind of a view back to the user. So that's still only one interaction, but it touches a controller, it touches routing, it touches the model, it might touch view rendering. Uh, so it's less than a full scenario, but it's more than a unit test, right? Because many moving parts have to work together. And a key concept we'll talk about in those tests is how do you test reliably when you've got things that depend on each other? How do you test something in isolation when it depends on other things? And unit tests are the kind that if, uh, when you have to write sort of simple tests in lower division courses and stuff, they probably tend to be more like this. You're usually testing a single method or function or maybe a single class. Um, and you're checking that the behavior of a single method does what you expect. And in the simplest possible case, if the method is a pure function where it has no side effects, you just pass it some arguments and you want to see if the right answer pops out. Those are kind of the simplest tests to write. Um, and then we're going to show what other mechanisms you can use to do tests that are more sophisticated from there. Okay, so this is where we are. And we're going to use a tool called RSpec, which is uh, if you've used JUnit or any of the sort of Java testing tools, it sort of comes from that family. But I think it's actually a lot more streamlined and graceful to use. Is how much is enough? How thorough is your testing? And this turns out to be uh, maybe not as obvious a question to answer as you might think. So how much, how do you know when you're done testing? How much testing is enough? Um, once again, there is no single formula cut and dried answer, but there is a lot we can say about bad practices and good practices. A bad practice is until it's time to ship. By the, by the time shipping date comes, that's enough testing. Uh, we've probably all used products that, that seem to have been tested this way. Um, OK, what's sort of the next simplest thing that you could imagine measuring? Well, uh, there's. Uh, the test to code ratio, which is just in the entire code base, how many lines of tests are there versus how many lines of app code. It might surprise you that in um, many cases there are more lines of tests than there are lines of code. Or maybe it doesn't surprise you. But a well-tested app, uh, like in a production system, a factor of 10 for that number is not unusual. That there are 10 times as many lines of testing as there are lines of code. And intuitively, I think of the reason as there's only one way for your app to behave correctly, but there's many ways that it can go wrong. So it shouldn't be surprising that you're essentially trying to exercise many different ways that it could go wrong. That means you have a lot of test code. You've got a lot of cases looking at different specific behaviors. So this is still a static measurement, though. It doesn't really say anything about what the tests are doing. So a, next, a better question might be, uh, could I evaluate either through some formal method? Like, can I, make, can I prove? what aspects of the app are being exercised or not exercised by certain tests. Uh, so meaning without executing the test, I can prove formally uh, what parts of the code are going to be visited. And we'll talk about different ways that we might think of what coverage means. Um, we're going to focus mostly on non-formal methods. And by non-formal, I don't mean informal, but I mean empirical. So we're not going to prove things about whether a particular behavior of the app has been exercised, but we are able to measure some things about, in general, how much of the app's functionality is probably being exercised by tests. So here's a simple function. Uh, actually, it's two simple functions. Uh, one is called foo and one is called bar, which once again demonstrates the extreme poverty of my imagination. Um, and you can see that down here, foo calls bar. Uh, this function obviously doesn't do anything very useful, but I want to use it to talk about coverage and why coverage is maybe not as obvious as it seems. So if we want to say, we would like to have tests that 
completely cover these two functions, foo and bar. What does completely cover mean in this case? What are some possible, like, what is a baseline meaning for completely covered? Yes? Uh, so, so one possibility is exhausting all tuples of these inputs, x, y, and z. Um, let's say for the sake of argument that x, y, and z are 32-bit are integers or something. Um, hopefully you believe me if I say probably not practical to try every single combination of three 32-bit ints. Um, but we could talk about uh, values that might cause changes in the code, right? So clearly some values for x will cause you to go down this branch of the if versus that one. Uh, what's an even simpler metric than that? Sim yes? Has every line been visited? Has every line been So the simplest, simplest is did I call foo, did I call bar? The next one is has I, have I called foo and bar from every place from which they could be called? And the one that, uh, remind me of your name? Homie. The one that Homie just said? is basically, have I at least executed every statement once? Have I touched every line, basically? Okay? And the gem that we'll be using for a lot of our coverage called SimpleCov, basically that's what it measures. Have you touched every line? There are other measures of coverage that go uh, beyond that. Um, C1 coverage says you've taken every branch in both directions. So notice that C0 in this case, here's a one line if. C0 just says this line was touched, but it doesn't necessarily say that both clauses of the if were touched. Um, now, in this particular example, we sort of end up having no choice, because in order for bar to get called, you have to have done this side of the if. But in general, C0 doesn't ask if every branch was taken in both directions. It just asks whether every branch was attempted. Right? You got to the if. C1 says, make sure you've taken every branch in both directions. And you can go farther and say C1 plus decision coverage. So not only does this branch have to take both the if path uh, and the else path, but in evaluating the if path, we have to look at every combination of y and z that could make this if go either way. So basically, every sub-expression within a conditional. That's C1 plus decisions. Um, and C2 is really hard. C2 is every code path possible. So starting from the entry into foo with particular values of x, y, and z, um, taking the path where this if is true and this if is true is a path. The path where this if is true, but uh, this one is false, is a different path. The path where this one is false, and you get the idea. right? And in an entire program, or even for an entire function, this can get very hairy very fast. And there is not necessarily widespread agreement that C2 buys you a whole lot more than, than uh, these levels in here. So I've in, for the purposes of this course, and sort of as a good rule of thumb, if your C0 coverage is really high, um, and it's quite easy to measure, and it doesn't cost much to measure it. Um, that's kind of what we're going to use as our baseline. But be aware that talking about dis, uh, code coverage um, is actually way more complicated. Uh, an, another type of coverage, which we won't discuss here, is called define and use coverage. So you know, uh, here's x, and somewhere before this, somebody called foo with a value for x. Where did x originally get? defined. Like, what's the last value of x that was assigned that's going to make it into this function? And the more exhaustive version of that is I'm going to look at every pair of places where x is set to a value and later x is consumed by someone. So look at every pair of places where those things happen. What they're called define and use pairs. So you can go really nuts about this. Um, but I think for the purposes of this course, let's focus on C0 coverage. Every statement has at least been touched. Going to extremes about testing. Um, Obviously, things like, you know, I kick the tires and it works. This is what a lot of people who don't have any formal software for anything think of as testing. They put their code into a browser. They try a couple of test cases. Looks good to me. And then they ship it. And then we end up with what happened with Obamacare when it was rolled out in 2008. Um, don't ship until it's 100% covered. 100% coverage is actually tricky to get. And how much better that is than like 96% coverage, uh, you know, it's not clear. So again, it's really a matter of, um, what are the, the guidelines that you're using to ask yourself, well, if I have low coverage, where is the coverage lowest? Like, is, is my coverage 96% because I have one function that isn't touched at all? Or is it because all the functions are mostly covered? So really, you're using coverage as a tool. It's not, a, you know, it, you're not using coverage as a threshold for go or no go. You're using it as a signal back to yourself to say, OK, where could my coverage be better? And maybe the places where my coverage could be better are actually pretty important, and they're under-tested. 
Um, likewise, some people say uh, unit tests are more thorough because you can stub things out and focus on specific cases. Other people say integration tests are more important because they're more realistic. They behave the way a user would behave. I would not go to extremes on either of those. The question is, what's the right balance between them? And in practice, each is going to find bugs that are missed by the other. Right? In unit tests, because we're stubbing out all of the interactions, there may be bugs related to those interfaces that we're going to miss. And in integration tests, because we're taking one, happy, one code path through every layer of the app, there's a whole bunch of things that could happen at each step that are not going to get covered. So they're going to miss a bunch of corner cases. So the general question is, uh, and I, we had this as one of the clicker questions last time, right? Are you testing an entire workflow? Are you testing one interaction, one method? Um, having a balance of different tests and sort of aiming for high coverage across all categories um, is your friend. And when you're doing deployment of the projects, we will help you get set up so that every time you basically do a push to GitHub, even if you're developing a branch, you'll be able to run all your tests and get instantaneous or almost instantaneous information about coverage and look literally line by line in your app at which lines of your app were never hit by any test. Okay, so good times. <clears throat> um, we've talked a little bit about the kinds of tests, but now we can kind of put them on the spectrum, right? We've seen uh, things that are more like unit tests, where you're focusing on a particular method, functional or module tests, where you touch a few methods or classes, and integration or system level tests. Unit tests tend to run really fast because they don't have to do a lot of setup. Integration tests like Cucumber tend to run slower. Why? Because it has to fire up the entire app, right? When you do a Cucumber scenario, it has to stand up your entire app so that it will behave the way that it would with a real user. When you're doing a unit test of one method, it just has to load that method. So unit tests tend to run faster per test, um, although they, the amount of code that they cover is smaller. Um, similarly, with unit tests, you can get very precise resolution. If you want to target a particular rare corner case, what happens when these inputs have these values, it's often much easier because you can isolate unit tests so well to do that kind of thing in a unit test rather than doing it in a coarse grain scenario. And you can usually boost your coverage better by writing more unit tests for the same reason, right? If there are code paths that are only exercised in rare situations or only exercised if the user makes a certain type of error when interacting with the app, it may be clumsy to write Cucumber scenarios that go to all those places, right? It's kind of like having a really you know, coarse grained stick and trying to pull an insect out of a hole or something. So having your scenarios there to test the main happy paths, the main common sad paths, but then having a bunch of extra tests at the unit or module level to sort of fill in those blanks, right? To, to get to the parts of the code that are harder to reach. Kind of like a toothbrush. <clears throat> 